Hello, and welcome back. In this lecture, I'll be covering one of the most fundamental ways in which a brand establishes a connection with an audience. As well as relevance and uniqueness, it's through the vehicle of storytelling. The word storytelling in and of itself will probably tell you why I stress the importance of thinking about people who engage with the business, organization, product, or service as an audience, and not as customers. Just think about the storytelling dynamic and the various interactions between a storyteller and his or her audience. An audience can be held spellbound and absolutely fascinated by a well-told story. They participate in the storytelling experience through their actions, reactions, and responses to the story being told. The better the reaction, the better a story a storyteller wants to tell. A classic story is absolutely priceless. A classic story always stands the test of time. Think about the brands that have withstood the test of time. They're all around us. Stories are an ancient form of communication. As a communication form and device, storytelling is universal. And they work for a reason. We use stories to make sense of our world and to share that understanding with others. Stories tap into emotion, one of the key things any brand must achieve. Stories also tap into memories through conscious and subconscious associations. Stories also create memories. As a medium, a story is an incredibly effective way of transmitting a message or an idea in a form that's highly memorable. This function and importance of strategic storytelling forms the larger part of this lecture. Here are the aims and outcomes for this session. At the end of this lecture, you'll have an understanding of how storytelling, as a device and as a medium, establishes direct connections with an audience. You'll also have an understanding of the basic elements that make up a, a strategically developed brand story. In our tutorials yesterday, you formed brand teams each team now has a live branding brief to work on. Start applying the storytelling device to the brand you will be developing. How will, you, how will you use storytelling to make a connection with a specific audience, one that is genuine, honest, and taps into an audience's emotions and memories? How will you convey difference, uniqueness, and the value of that uniqueness and difference through a story? We all get bombarded by buy this messages every single day. We literally receive thousands of them. They fill our inboxes, usually as spam. If you have a Google Mail account, you'll notice that even Google started sending paid advertising emails to its Gmail customers. They fill our social media spaces in the form of adverts, banner ads, and sponsored posts. We have sponsored links on search engines. We have them in the form of advertising text messages. And then there's TV adverts, adverts in cinemas, on the radio, in newspapers, in magazines, on billboards and flyers, cold calling, word of mouth from family and friends. These messages are literally everywhere. It's a 24-7 business. Out of the thousands of buy this messages you get bombarded with on a daily basis, how many do you actually remember? How many were actually relevant to your wants, likes, preferences, or needs? Why do you remember the few buy messages that you do remember? What is it about them that makes them memorable? Chances are you're already familiar with the brand and predisposed to remembering what it is they have to say or story was told that got your interest. Buy this is a one-way message. It's, an, it's almost a command, an order. And these messages typically come from a source that's faceless, unknowable. They don't really care what we think, or how we feel, or what we like. Theirs is the impression that we are merely the walking and talking life support systems for wallets, purses, and bank accounts. There are only a few industries, namely haute couture, the art world, luxury products, and publishing, 
that can successfully use this methodology. We almost want them to be mysterious, unknowable, and aspirational. Yet, even the world of haute couture, the art world, and luxury products tell stories, even though they could almost get away with not doing so at all. The music industry, banking, telephone companies, insurance companies, and similar, trade and buy this messaging. It is their hallmark method of, of marketing, and we've seen how well their approach has fared for them in recent years. Stories are a completely different kind of animal. A story is two-way communication that invites interactions from an audience. Stories do a couple of things. They build awareness of a company or business. They create favorable attitudes and perceptions. They establish trust, beliefs, and relationships. They invoke a sense of community. Stories motivate. Stories can also influence public opinion on products, services, or issues. Always remember that brand storytelling isn't a sprint. While it operates in the short term, it's about building a long-term impact through a succession of well-crafted strategic stories. One story builds upon another, kind of like chapters in a book. Too many brands are in love with frequency. Indeed, it seems that online story frequency and quantity trumps quality. You don't build a deep and storied brand purely by posting and retweeting with gusto. By setting your brand storylines, by deciding what your brand is not going to talk about as much as what it is going to talk about, you begin taking a strategic approach to storytelling, ensuring that each story that you tell links back to a specific business strategy and specific business goal. With this approach, you begin to adopt a longer term view. You can't load a buy this message with a value proposition that strikes a meaningful chord with an audience through their beliefs, thoughts, memories, or emotions. Buy this messages, they're simply a hollow experience. Companies that pursue this way of marketing go for the lowest common denominator when it comes to establishing difference, and that's usually something to do with price. Storytelling builds a bridge between a company and an audience. Stories communicate values and beliefs, things that any brand should, should stand for and or represent. You can even tell a story about how your company makes a difference. It's worth remembering that a strong brand is a combination of facts and emotions. More and more, people buy with their hearts. Strong brands build on clearly defined values. A good story communicates those values in an understandable language. Done well, it creates a bond with your audience that can last a lifetime. While we'll be getting into the actual mechanics of story writing in SMU 102, for now, think about storytelling as the frame that surrounds the picture made of words and visuals that will form the brand stories you'll be telling. In other words, for now, we'll be concentrating on the whys of storytelling and how the process and act of st strategic storytelling is important. There are purchases I've made without even thinking about it. In part, this is influenced by previous experiences I've had with a brand. A larger part is my fami familiarity with that brand. Over time, I've come to know that they believe in the same things that I believe, or they want to achieve the same things I want to achieve. And they succeed in conveying this through their own strategic use of storytelling. While each of their stories is different, there is a consistent theme. For example, I choose to purchase software and technology products developed through something called open source. Open source means products or software that can be freely used, changed and shared in both modified and unmodified form by anyone. Typically you don't have to pay for them, if you really like them you can give them a, do a donation. 
Open so source software is made by many people and distributed under non-restrictive licenses. Android phones and tablets are, one, are, are some examples. Web content management systems like Drupal, Joomla, and Mambo are others. Software like GIMP, Open Document, and Inkscape are yet further examples. I like supporting the small guys and watching them grow. I like championing more democratically produced software and technology. I like the freedom of not being restricted by onerous terms and conditions. I finance the likes of Apple, Windows, and Microsoft about as much as I'm going to, and we usually only make purchases from them if there isn't an open source option available or forthcoming. When it comes to surfing wetsuits, I'll only buy from Quicksilver. In terms of cut and manufacturing, it's a brand that simply works for me. While I will happily buy surfing-related products from its rivals, I will only ever invest in a new wetsuit from one company and one company only. It's the same when it comes to charities. There are those that I support and have supported them for decades. Despite there being similar charities, I feel that the ones that I do support share my worldview. I feel we share a similar ethos. Those two words, I feel, are everything in this context. I feel we share these things because of the value propositions, beliefs, and uniqueness communicated in each charity's brand stories. I am familiar with their values, their beliefs, and their worldview. All of the examples I've just given, open source products, wetsuit purchases, and charities, addresses each of the bullet points given on this slide. They do this through knowing who their audience is, what their audience cares about, or feels is important, and more importantly, how their audience thinks. Their stories are crafted to hit all of these touch points. Storytelling and memory make the perfect marriage. To begin with, both are created by and operate within a social context. Neither is a passive experience, and by this I mean a story and memory aren't something that are done to us. They are an active form of, en of engagement. In other words, memory and story are experiences we participate in. Branding, storytelling, and memory each require the interplay between the physical and the abstract. The message itself connects with the physical in the form of the product, service, organization or business that the message is actually talking about. The abstract refers to the connections we make with memory or feeling or some other association that we create in our mind. Branding storytelling and memory, they require the process of association through the use of storytelling metaphors. It's the metaphors in the story that actually convey a lot of the, the, the value in the meaning within the story. It's the metaphor that sticks in memory. For instance, when a brand uses the image of Che Guevara, that image is a metaphor that implies specific values and meanings to an audience. Let's use the Harley Davidson brand as a metaphor. If I created a campaign featuring a guy on a Harley driving past his doppelganger who's walking past on the sidewalk, now let's make this doppelganger an investment banker type. You know, the thousand pound handmade pinstripe suit with a pair of Brooks Brothers shoes, a Gucci briefcase, diamond and gold cufflinks, and a 300 pound haircut. This guy stopping in, you know, this investment banker guy is stopping in his tracks, looking furtively but kind of longingly at his twin on the Harley. So, what am I saying about Harley Davidson as a brand? Slap a tagline with words along the lines of live free or release your inner maverick. Well, that metaphor is starting to say something when it's matched to that image. That's an image that writes its own backstory and subplots. It's a simple story to craft because we know two things. The Harley Davidson brand and what we think and feel about that investment banker type guy in the suit. We put our own meanings, emotions, feelings and context onto a simple image with some simple text. 
that storytelling at its most basic. Here's another one. Red Bull gives you wings. That's a pretty basic story. And we've all seen the basic images that go with that story. Why would we want wings? To fly, obviously. But here's the really clever subtext. We either want wings to fly away from something or towards something. Think about that one for a minute. It depends on whether you're a glass half empty or a glass half full kind of person. It is a genius storytelling device. Memory, metaphor, and story contains truths and fictions, thoughts and emotions. All of these overlap. The fusion of memory, metaphor, and story enables consumers to create meaning around and see personal relevance within a specific brand. So let's come back to those buy, the, buy this messages. Buy this messages, they want us to be as they want us to be passive. These messages are things that are done to us and not with us or even for us. Strategic branding messages are substantively different. Strategic brand messages want an audience to be active, to participate, to engage with the story being told. These kinds of messages encourages an audience to make associations with memories, with meanings, with values and beliefs that are important to them. It's no coincidence that storytelling is one of humanity's oldest crafts. We're programmed for stories, and we love to remember the good ones. It's not an idle pastime. Storytelling is something we virtually have to do if we want to remember anything. Stories are also organic. A story can be adapted depending on the stimuli of the moment and the goals. Branding allows companies to present actions or events to an audience and retell them, creating a new story about those actions or events. Our audience is composed of subgroups, and I refer to these subgroups as tribes. Marketing people refer to these subgroups as demographics. We'll be getting into all of this a little bit later on um, within this whole unit. I'll give a quick example. Think of Nike. It appeals to men and women. Those are two broad demographics, or otherwise, as I refer to them, tribes. Taking the male demographic, there are additional subgroups. There are professional athletes, amateur athletes, fitness buffs. Three different additional athletic subgroups or tribes. There are guys who wear Nike for fashion. That's another tribe. Nike has further tribes based on age, location, income, education, and the like. Nike takes the same story and subtly alters it to appeal to specific tribes within its overall audience. Again, we'll delve into this in much more detail later on within this branding unit. For now, just be aware that stories can be, in some cases have to be, tweak to appeal to different groups within your audience. This is what I mean by retelling stories. We partner with an audience in creating their memories about our brand, hopefully ones that they'll want to share on things like music reviews, festival reviews, market reviews, film reviews, product reviews, social networking. Our efforts not only influence how easily an audience recollects a product or a service experience, but also whether they remember the experience as satisfying or dissatisfying. Just like storytelling, memory is a highly social function. The process of remembering can only really be understood as a kind of chemistry between inner processes and outer settings. It is the dynamic interplay between inner and outer that gives rise to the whole thing we know as memory. While there's a lot of psychology in this, I don't want to turn this into a psychology lesson. Suffice to say, there are entire careers based on psychology and marketing. For our purposes, at this stage, you just simply need to be aware that interactions create impressions. We interact when we meet new people. 
we interact to different degrees with people that we know to varying degrees. A new interaction establishes a foundation for future, for future interactions to add depth to. Each new interaction deepens or changes our impressions. Collectively, each interaction molds an overall impression that la lays the foundation for a reputation. Brand stories are one such interaction that builds an impression and creates an overall reputation. There are a few key points about memory worth noting. It doesn't take much time to form an impression that can happen in a microsecond. Expectations about a person can influence what's remembered about that individual after an initial interaction. Therefore, information impacts the impression one person makes on another. The same holds true for brands. Expectations about a brand can influence our audience's impressions. We strive to craft brand stories that touch emotional triggers and memories for our audience. Why? Interactions that carry triggers that touch emotions, values, beliefs, and memory, they just remain in the, in the long-term memory. It's how our brains are wired. Stories are the perfect delivery conduit for memory. Quite a few of the materials in the reading room address the connection between brands, stories, interactions, and memory, and I highly suggest that you read them. If this is an area that you would like to explore more deeply, there's an excellent book by Susan Engel, which is referenced here on the slide. It's worth noting that the environment that we're raised in influences memory and memory prompts. Early childhood stories become important frames of reference, and those frames of reference actually influence story experiences, associations, or triggers in adulthood. Early childhood influences the products and brands that we buy. You think about it, it kind of makes sense. You know, we're always basing our impressions or experiences upon previous experiences. And let's face it, in childhood, we have a lot of those kind of experiences. So whether it's your favorite breakfast cereal, maybe the kind of clothes that you wear, where you like to go for holiday, all of those factors can be prompts that a clever brand can actually trigger and call upon within their stories. Basically, early childhood frames our view of the world. Childhood memories and associations are virtually like memory souvenirs. Think about the things you grew up with and were surrounded by. Think about the music, television shows, designs. If you're of my generation, think about those funky plastic 70s cups and those wonderful 70s clothing. Think about the food that you ate, the house that you lived in, the forms and styles of education that you had, all of those sorts of things. Some of these things are universal across the country, like TV shows, for instance. Some are very different within a country. Houses in the countryside or in the sur suburbs look very different from urban housing. Take a look at the three images on the slide and think about childhood memories that might be universal. As I said, watching television, eating a family meal, bath time, just the real basic things. Think about how each space would shape different childhood memories. Understanding such similarities and differences helps us craft stories that resonate with an audience. Our senses play an important role in recording and recalling memory. Memory allows people from similar cultures, backgrounds, or a mindset to transmit information to one another. This is what we mean by cultural references. Surfers have a cultural and community identity formed by similar experiences and interests. When I say something like, I went on a donny today to another surfer, that surfer will know exactly what I mean. Ravers have their own identity, community, set of shared experiences, and even it's their own language. Baby boomers have theirs. Each tribe communicates with a sort, sort of shorthand. 
that shorthand is based upon and only works because of memories of similar experiences. Memory allows people to find shared meaning and to respond to specific actions or events in a common way. We see this most clearly in politics, social issues, and religion. Words like politics, religion, and social issues are a verbal kind of shorthand that works because you'll have a memory for each one. You'll have a memory based on a sensory experience. So to wrap this point up regarding memory, I've covered three basic things that create and influence memory. The first, social factors are based on interactions. The second, cultural factors. And the third, sensory factors. Brown stories can prompt memories using any or a combination of these three factors. Understanding the connection points between branding and memory is part and parcel of building a relationship with an audience. And that process of building is a process known as Customer Relationship Management, or CRM for short. And this is one of the very few times you'll ever hear me refer to an audience as customers. Personally, I think CRM is a horrific term with a horrific mindset, but it is industry standard and something that you should be familiar with. Understanding the building blocks of shared experience, whether it's the social, cultural, or sensory aspects of memory, frames the strategic branding stories that we tell, how we tell those stories, and the tools and the contents we use to tell them. In other words, we manage audience relationships. Therefore, we have to grasp how our audience store, retrieve, and reconstruct memories of every brand interaction. And we do this because every interaction with a brand can make or break a brand. As I've mentioned previously, memory is story-based. For instance, it can almost be like a non-fictional story. And by this, a couple of points I'd like to make. As a non-fictional story, there's the autobiographical memory of an event. The times, places, associated emotions, and other contextual who, what, when, where, why knowledge that can actually be explicitly stated within that memory. To boil that point down, it is the collection of past personal experiences that occurred at a particular time and place that contains both our beliefs and our knowledge about the world. Another example of the non-fictional, it's a belief, a belief is something we recall and consider to be truth. And the last point I'd like to make on this non-fictional side of things, knowledge is the information on which truth is based. Memory can also be a semi-fictional story. There is the memory of meanings, understandings, and other concept-based knowledge. This aspect of memory underlies the conscious recollection of factual information and general knowledge about the world. This kind of memory can give meaning to otherwise meaningless words and sentences. We can learn about new concepts by applying our knowledge learned from things in the past to what we're learning in the present. This kind of memory is imperfect. There are always slight alterations, embellishments, and subtractions with every recall. Memory, like a story, can also create. And that's a very polite way of saying, can sometimes enter the world of fiction. How can it create? Well, it can create a belief which is something we recall and consider to be the truth. It doesn't necessarily have to be the truth, we just need to consider that it is the truth. It can also create knowledge and familiarity, which are the information sources on which truth is based. Putting all of this into action, both the non-fiction, the kind of semi-fiction, and fiction, let's consider belief, familiarity, knowledge and memory for a moment. A perfect example of this, here's a logo for Prada. Some of you will be familiar with the Prada brand, more than likely, 
if you will have a direct experience of owning a Prada product. Despite a lack of owning a Prada product, we know what Prada is. When it comes to Prada, there's kind of one overarching response that marketing kind of researchers get. People will say things like, Prada makes me feel sophisticated, cosmopolitan, and continental. We get that. Indeed, we're programmed to understand this simple message, whether we agree with it or not, and whether or not we even ever own a single Prada product. Socially and culturally, this message is universal. It makes me feel sophisticated, cosmopolitan, and continental. Every culture, every social group has its own context for what is sophisticated, what's cosmopolitan, and what constitutes being continental. Our memories shape our context for these ideas and ideals. Our memories shape how we interact with these concepts. Whatever subjective values we choose to associate with the concepts of sophisticated, cosmopolitan, and continental, we know what they are. And product communicates these concepts in its branding stories. We may never recall a specific Prada brand story, but we do recall the logo. For Prada, that's enough. For its true aficionados, they will remember specific adverts or the models used in a campaign and the specific aspects of their favorite Prada brand stories. Those aficionados, they're meant to remember that stuff. As for the rest of us, a simple logo has the power to convey meaning, value, memory, and even emotion. As you're no doubt beginning to realize, psychology plays an important role in branding. An essential part of branding stories is an emotional trigger. This refers back to the points I've been making about the importance of making emotional connections with an audience, which creates a memory that links to your brand. Identifying the elements of your brand that makes it unique, wrapping it in a clearly conveyed value proposition, and delivering it in the form of a brand story or a brand experience that makes an emotional connection with a specific audience, this is the fundamental art of branding. This is why crafting stories with emotional triggers and or value benefits are as powerful, if not more so, than stories about functional benefits. As an example, let me use Dyson and, well, any other Hoover. A Dyson is more than the sum of its parts. It's an experience. Owning a Dyson is a lifestyle choice. Buying a Dyson says something about the person who actually buys it. Sure, it's a Hoover. It sucks up dust. It sucks up dirt and debris like any other Hoover. Dyson adverts mention the unique design, the power, and some of the functionality of the, of the product. But wrapped in a lifestyle wrapping designed to trigger desire in its specific target audience. There's no mention of price or cost, not in the television adverts. Even in the print adverts, it may be there, but it's not emphasized, it's always small text. There's no emphasis on price or cost. Dyson doesn't even have to go there. All Dyson wants you to do is think of your home as a Dyson home and everything that goes along with that aspirational thought. Really watch and listen to a Dyson advert when the next one comes on telly. Or really read and look, look at one, if you're looking at a print advert. Better still, you can check out Dyson ads on YouTube. The language, images, look at those homes, look at the background furniture, knickknacks, baubles, and all the rest of that stuff that are used in the adverts they formed almost the backdrop of the whole story. So the overall point I'm making with this example is Dyson is exceedingly clever at crafting stories that touch strong emotional triggers and strong emotional triggers that are designed along the lines of lifestyle and aspiration. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap things up by sticking with the Dyson example. I mentioned all the stuff happening in the background in Dyson's advertising. The houses, the furniture, the knickknacks, and all that stuff. 
These additional story elements, which seem incidental, only add to the story. They not only provide a deeper context for Dyson's brand, brand of Hoover, they add depth and further meaning to the story Dyson's telling. The ingredients we use in telling a story are also memory and emotional triggers, things like music, images, dance moves, colors. Learn the ingredients and the combination of ingredients that work for your audience. Carefully select and design additional cues by using distinctive and familiar elements that your audience can connect to and respond positively to. We've spent some time covering how and why stories work. At this point, you should just have an appreciation and understanding of why stories are the perfect delivery format to convey difference, relevance, and values for a brand. We've also covered the relationship between memory and storytelling, and how important audience memory is for the branding process. In the second part of the lecture for this session, we'll be exploring the essential attributes that make a compelling brand story. We'll cover how to identify attributes and elements of your brand that make it different from any other and conveys your own brand's values.